and their directions was very similar to Adam and Eve's directions. But they told him the story of what I didn't know, read it. Lot, I mean Noah, sinned. He fell short by becoming drunk with wine. And then his children, well his son, Ham, sinned also by coming in and seeing his father's nakedness. Now seeing his father's nakedness was one thing, but what he did afterwards was what made it even more wrong, which is he did not act in an appropriate way. He did not act in a way that God would be pleased. The Bible says that he he mocked this happening, that what he saw. We don't know if he mocked in a way that he made it a joke or if he mocked in a way that he made it a gossip. But we know that he mocked, <laughs> which was inappropriate and not pleasing to God. Amen. He too was punished for this sin. Now the author of the book of Genesis is Moses as we know. And it's amazing that all these accounts coming up to the account that I'm about to read, they have some central themes in them and some central key points that we need to look at. Although they're totally different stories and totally different people from totally different times. So amazing is the word of God, amen? How okay. amazing is this book? That leads me to my, different, my, my next point. This book. This book is not just a book. It's not like other books. We know this. It's alive. Okay. It proves this to us over and over. And many times over. Every time we read it, we realize how true that statement is. Yeah. So before I read the account, I want to read 2 Timothy and chapter 3 and verse 16. If you'll turn there with me. <coughs> And you find it, say amen. 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 Right. And it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Amen. amen. So we see many things in this one verse. Here. It says, Firstly, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we know there that this scripture is God's word, not man's word, God's word. So this scripture holds for us standards determined by God, not standards determined by man. Because man's standards, as we all know, man's standards are flawed and corrupted and cannot be trusted 100%. However, we have the solace in our hearts and the affirmation that this word that we read and that we trust in, that we place our faith in, is indeed inspired by God himself. So that is the first thing. Secondly, we see why we read the word of God and why it's supposed to be important to us. It is profitable for doctrine, what to live by, for reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. So it is a lesson book. It's a book to learn from. Amen? It's not a book that you read to get laughs or jokes. It's not a book that you read for excitement or thrill. Although you might get some excitement and some thrilling parts in the Bible, that is not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is to learn from. So when we read this story, I want you to remember this verse. That this story was a story that came from God himself, that Moses penned. This is a story that we are supposed to get a message from and we are supposed to learn something from. Amen? Because that is the purpose of God's will. So let's turn to it. Genesis 11 from verse 1 to 9. So I'll read the whole, the whole scripture. And it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for water. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. 
which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Amen? Now by Bible standards, <coughs> this story and this account is a short story and a short account. Because most of the other stories that you will find in the Bible are much longer than nine verses. But still, in this nine verses, there's much to learn. Amen? Amen. So, let's get into the message. The message tonight, I have entitled it, God's Purpose versus Man's Ambitions. Now, just on the title alone, I'm sure many of you can relate already to what is happening in the story and what is going to be shared tonight. Because God has a purpose for everyone. Amen? Amen. And for man in general. And man, since the beginning of time, as I reiterated earlier, from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel to Noah to this story and going on throughout the Bible, man's ambitions have always gotten in the way Amen. of what God has intended for man <coughs> from the beginning till now. Amen? So, this is an age old battle. God's purpose versus man's ambitions. And this story is a classic story that depicts this. Amen? So, as I read it, I'm sure much of the, uh, the story came back to your memory from when it as a child. But we're going to go deeper than the child story that we learned many years ago. Right? I want to stress in particular on some of the earlier, earlier stories that I said. So, we'll be going back into so many earlier stories to show some similarities in this particular story that we read tonight. I want to stress on firstly, verse 2, where it says, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. What I want to stress on in this particular verse is the fact that they journeyed from the east, that particular nautical point. Amen? Why I want to draw that illustration is because if you all remember some some time ago pastor taught us on a, in a particular message of the significance of that particular point in direction east symbolically especially in this book of genesis the east symbolizes being far away from god and we can prove this in the bible if we look at the uh, the story of adam and eve again and i think it's Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. You'll turn there with me. Amen. All found? Amen. All right, it says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep them away from the tree of life. And he sent, he sent them further east, right? Amen. The Bible says so. Send them further east of the garden. So the garden would represent the promised land. Amen? Amen. And east would represent the separation of the man from where God had intended him to be. Amen. Amen? Amen. So that's significant. If we look also in the other story of Cain and Abel, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So he went even further east after he sinned. So again, Cain was removed from where he was further east away from God. Amen? Amen. Because of what? What caused this? Sin. sin is the separation from God. That is what it is. Amen. So God symbolizes this in the movement of the man further east. Amen? Amen. So, Again, in this story, in chapter 11, we go back to chapter 11, it's, it shows where these people came from. They came from the east, and according to research, they went even further east to build the city. <laughs> Amen? So, you know, you get the idea of the kind of people we're talking about. So, during that illustration there, we see man continually from the beginning 
moving further and further away from God and what he intended for man, which is the garden. He had the garden there and intended for man to, to take care of it and to, to be the, dom the dominant one over it and in charge of it. And man kept sinning and moving further and further away from God. Amen? And we are still doing it today. Amen? You would think that we would have learned after all that time has passed, after this book was written and all the examples were given, <coughs> you would think that man would learn. But no, on the contrary, man has probably got even worse and been and even further away from God than he ever was. Because in the story of Noah, we saw how terrible it was that just one family was found to be upright in the whole face of it. The Bible also says that in the latter days, which I believe we are in now, Amen. how many of you agree with me? Amen. Amen. But we are in the latter days. They said that the latter days will be even worse than the days of Noah. Amen. So that makes you wonder now. How many people will be found to be upright today? If it's worse than in the time of Noah, just one family was found to be upright. How many will be found to be upright today? Amen. The greater was. And out of that small number, I'm sure it's a small number, out of that small number of people who would be found to be upright today, let's ask ourselves this personal question. Will we be found among those few? Will we be counted as God's remnant on the face of it? Or are we moving further and further east away from Him? Amen? We must ask ourselves this because Nowadays, we have a false sense of security. Why I say this is because, as we read in the, in, the, in the accounts before, when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? God came down to them and spoke to them directly. And He said to them what they did wrong. And He personally gave them their punishment. Amen? Similarly, when Cain fell, God spoke to him directly. And God gave him his punishment personally. Amen? Amen. Nowadays, God doesn't come down and accuse us directly, does he? Has God ever come to you, Brother Christian, and said, Brother Christian, you should not have done that? No, he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it directly anymore. So we have that false sense of security for that reason. If God came down and told Adam and Eve, you all did wrong, you think they would doubt? If God took them and told them, you, because you did wrong, I will place you over here. And the earth will be cursed because of this. And you woman will have pain in childhood because of this. They were sure about what they did. And they were sure about why they were punished. And they were sure about what the punishment was. But today, God doesn't come and say, bad boy, Pastor Alex, bad brother Eddie. You did so and so, so now, as a result, I will punish you in this way. He doesn't do that. So we think, much of the times, we think that we are okay. Much of the times, we lie to ourselves. And human beings are so amazing that we believe our own lies. That's how amazing we are, right? We believe our own lies. So we will lie to ourselves and justify something that we do know in the back of our minds, the conscience that God gave us. We know in the back there that we are doing something wrong. Amen. But we justify this. And we believe after some time passes, and we keep justifying it, we believe, you know what, I'm okay. And we are not. <laughs> Amen. And the punishment might come and might not realize that it was a punishment. And we do not get ourselves right with the Lord. Amen. So that is the false sense of security that we have today that we have to be very cautious of. Amen? So we might read some of these accounts and say, the Lord was so harsh to Adam and Eve. Oh, why was the Lord so harsh to Cain? But that was mercy. If you think about it, as I just explained to you, maybe we might wish that God would come now and tell us when we do something wrong as well. And give us a direct punishment. That way we will know for sure with a certainty that we offended the Lord. This might drive us to humble before Him quicker than in these days. 
we sin and we forget about it and we don't humble ourselves and we go on our merry way and everything seems fine Amen? Amen. So we need to be cautious of this. Amen. So that is one of the verses I wanted to draw. East. <coughs> Remember the East. Amen? Amen. So I have separated the title into two parts. God's purpose versus man's ambitions. Right? So let's go into what's God's purpose for men. Amen? According to what we've studied in, in Genesis before, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, if we go back, let's go back there, and we'll see what God said to Adam and Eve. And it says, and God blessed them. Now, remember we mentioned that before. It was the only creation that He actually blessed. Amen? And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Amen? Amen? So that is part of man's purpose right there that God told to Adam and Eve. He said that that is what I have created you to do. That's part of it. Of course, having communion with him and worshiping him and having a relationship with him is also an important part of that. They would have understood that. But they were given a job and a purpose. Amen? Amen? And it was clear. However, we know the story. One of the few rules that God gave them was not to eat of the fruit. And yet still, they broke that. And they were punished. Amen? But God gave them their purpose. So that's, that's the purpose, right? To be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fall of the air, and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. So we could say that was their purpose, amen? So God gave them their purpose. Also, so too, He gave Cain and Abel a purpose. And if we read Genesis 4, 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, you'll see there in that account. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wrong? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Amen? So here, God is showing that Cain knew what his purpose was. Amen? The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrong? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted because as i said his brother abel brought the offering that god had intended that was instructed to them as children growing up by their parents this is what god accepts this is what god requires this is the ritual that we do they learn this growing up and we know this because as i said his brother knew exactly what to do his brother did well in the sight of the Lord. But Cain, he did not. He, he did his own thing. He had his own ambitions. <coughs> he had his own plan. And he brought it before the Lord. And the Lord told him. The Bible says that the Lord didn't have any respect for his sacrifice and his offering. And he became angry with the Lord. And he, and he became angry with his brother. So his purpose and his, his direction from God, his instructions from God, he ignored it. Amen? And he had his own ideas. And imagine, he still probably wasn't as bad as some of us today. If you think about it. Because although he did the wrong thing, he still tried to do it unto the Lord. He still tried to sacrifice unto the Lord. Amen? He didn't go to a different God. He went to the Lord. So many of us today forget about the Lord altogether. And what we do and what we plan has nothing to do with what God wants and what God intends and what has no thought of God at all but still he he went against what he knew was the instruction of his parents and what is the instruction of God and God reminded him and instead of receiving God's word with gladness and with a, with a humble heart he became angry Amen 
And this anger led to the first murder. And it's recorded here in the Bible that is what people associate Cain with. Oh, Amen? What else do we know about Cain? Other than he's the first murderer. But a terrible legacy to leave. Amen? Amen. And that is his legacy forever and forever and forever. He was the first murderer. Or because he did not subdue himself, himself to God's will as he knew he should have. Amen? And I'm sure all of us can relate to this. There's always some time in our life that we forget to humble before him and put him first. Also, what I think is important to remember in this particular account with Cain is his attitude towards his sin. Amen? He was angry when the Lord revealed to him his wrong. And as I said before, I am sure that in the back of his mind, in his conscience somewhere, he would have known that what he is doing is against God's instructions. <coughs> he would have definitely known that this is not what he was, has been taught. He would have known. But still, he chose to do wrong. And when God showed him his wrong, he became angry. Now how many of us would have seen that? I have seen that many times in my Christian walk. And I have walked less time than many of you in here. So I'm sure that all of us here would have seen similar to Cain. It might not have resulted in murder, but still, when the, someone's wrong is brought before them, oftentimes people become angry. They become frustrated with you. They become offended. Sometimes they become um, depressed <coughs> because of our wrong that was identified. But what do we read in in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16? The word is for reproof as well and for correction. Amen? In righteousness. So if your brother in the Lord cannot come to you and show you that you have made an error, then who can? But we see even here, God himself was showing Cain his error and his wrong. And he responded with anger. Yes. Amen? So, much less if I come to a brother and say, Brother, you wrong. I will get a terrible reaction many of the time. If God himself got a, a terrible reaction, who am I, right? But that's, this is what he would is for. <coughs> of course, when we show our brother, is wrong, we have to do it in wisdom. Amen. Amen. And we cannot just attack people because we, we have the Bible. You know, um, we have to be wise in the Lord. Amen. But people's attitude, people's attitude, our own attitude when we are reproved, when we are shown our wrong, is very important to have the right attitude. This is another example of the wrong attitude with Cain. But how many of us have that humility? How many of us have that humbleness of heart yeah. to receive something hard as reproof? Because no one likes to be told that they're wrong. I don't think there has anybody in here in this room who enjoys being told that they're wrong. Human beings don't like this. We love to be right, even though we know we're wrong sometimes. <laughs> you know? Sometimes we know we're wrong, but we still want to be right. I'm like that a lot of the times. My wife is present at Kala. <laughs> right? But I love to be right. You know, and and this 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 idea of being right, maybe today more than more than any other time in the, in the history of the world, is a problem. Because now everyone in the world has rights. <clears throat> and what does that mean? It's become ridiculous now. It's become ridiculous. Everyone has rights. So you have to be careful. You can't, you can't preach the word too loud because everybody has rights. <laughs> and some of these rights that people have, they don't align with the Bible. They don't align with God. Amen. 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 Now they've taken prayer out of the schools in the, in the United States. You can't pray in school. It's an offense, actually. It's not just wrong, it's an offense. They have the right to say that you can't pray to you. And you cannot have a problem with that. Imagine that. Homosexuals have rights in this world today. Almost worldwide. 
they have rights. <clears throat> so you can't speak out against them publicly because they have rights. You actually don't have the right to speak about speak against their rights. That's how terrible the world is now. Everybody has rights. Everybody wants to be in the right. So even somebody who is a homosexual who in times past could have never come out and publicly said something like that because it was known to be something that is wrong. Now, on the other hand, it's totally upside down. They have rights and you, as the, as the person who is as God intended, you have to be careful and step around them. So it's almost queer to be straight now rather than queer to be a homosexual. The world is upside down, right? Yeah. It's all turning all, all over the place. And many of the men of God, I put that in quotation marks, they have come to support these things. Yes. Many Christian leaders, or I say Christian mostly, they have come to, to marry these people in their churches because they have rights. And nobody wants to offend people who have rights. Amen? So, <coughs> wrapped up in being right, we have become that these people have rights as well. And now, coming out of the homosexuals having rights, I don't know if you all heard, but there's a group who have come out and said that they need to have rights too. You know who this group is? Pedophiles. Yes? Yes? Pedophiles have come forward and said, if these people are homosexual and they have rights, why I can have rights as well? Because one of the premises that homosexuals may have rights is that man cannot be allowed to love whoever he wants. That's how they put it across. It sounds nice when you put it like that, right? A man can love whoever he, he wants. And why should we be against love? Why should we be against, be against marriage? Marriage is an honorable thing before the Lord. I've heard some of these religious leaders say this. And they said, whatever kind of marriage, God recognizes it. So, the pedophiles have said, well, then, if, if they are allowed to love whoever they want, yeah. and they are allowed to marry whoever they want, then, for sure, we could love whoever we want and marry whoever we want, but they are benefits. Amen. So imagine a day in this in, in, in the future where these people have rights as well. Because this is the direction we're headed, amen. We're not getting better, we're getting worse. So nowadays if we preach a message against any one of these things, these people will be offended. And they will react. According, they will react against whatever you see, whatever you preach. Amen? Amen? But I want to encourage you, don't fall short and don't lose courage to preach against what you know is sinful. Amen? Because even God was, was Cain reacted against God as well, even God himself, when he was reproved. So, be prepared to be reproved. To, to reprove and to, to get that kind of reaction. Be prepared. If you even God himself could have gotten a bad reaction, we should be prepared to get a bad reaction. Amen? Amen. So the attitude though, <coughs> attitude to be reproved is very important. We cannot be like him and become angry. Amen. Or on the other extreme become depressed. And say, woe is me, I'm always wrong, I always do the wrong thing. I can't I can't seem to, to get myself together. Some people think like that. If you tell them about one wrong thing. They think that they, they, they can't hold themselves together and that they're always wrong and they get depressed. We must have the right attitude. We must recognize our wrongs, be strong enough to admit it, and strong enough to humble ourselves. Because humility is true strength, amen? amen. Alright, so we move on to Genesis chapter 9, which is the chapter that was last read. And verse, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Again, we're talking about God's purpose, right? Amen. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. 
Amen. So this is a similar purpose given by God to Noah and his family, as was given to Adam and Eve, as we read earlier in Genesis 1:28. So God gave them a purpose again. Amen. But part of their purpose, obviously, was to have a relationship with God in everything that they do, and to be obedient to God in everything that they do. Later on in the story, we read that, sadly, Noah fell into drunkenness, which God does not support. And his son Ham also fell into sin by looking upon his father's naked body. Amen? So, God had purpose for that. And we know that Ham knew better. It's not that he made a mistake and he didn't realize that there was something wrong that he had done. Because his brothers, knew what was right and they acted in a totally different manner than Ham. So if they knew, then he should have known as well. But he chose wrongly and he was cursed for that and his whole line of descendants after him as well. So important to note, we have instructions given to us from the Bible. God's instructions itself, as we read in 2 Timothy. This is God's word. Amen? Amen? This word has been inspired by God Himself. It has instructions in here. How would have gotten instructions as well from His parents? They would have handed down instructions over the years from Adam and Eve come straight down. What God wants from man. What man is required to do before God. What God reveres as holy and righteous and what man should do to honor God. But still, he acted wrongfully. Amen? And a terrible curse was placed upon him and his descendants. So, knowing God's word and being exposed to God's truth could be a a privilege and also be a burden because for knowing and still choosing to do wrong is much worse than not knowing and choosing to do wrong. Amen? Amen. If you understand what I'm saying, Amen. if you never knew the truth, then the punishment is a lot less than knowing the truth and still choosing to go against it. Amen? Amen? Knowing what Jesus did for us, going on the cross and sacrificing his life for our sins, being innocent, stepping down from heaven itself, upon this filled earth, to die for us sinners who deserve nothing. He came down to do that for us and we repay him by despising that very sacrifice. Yes. So if we think about it in those terms, we see how much of a travesty it is to sin before the Lord. Amen? Amen. It is to despise the greatest sacrifice anybody would ever give for you. Amen? Amen? It's, ter it's a terrible sin. And imagine how the Lord Jesus might look upon us when we despise that sacrifice that he made. It must be truly disappointing in his eyes. I'll tell you a story about myself. Um, just in light of that disappointment. When I was in, in secondary school, I used to like to do school plenty. Right? I used to skip class and, and go online and, and, and have all my friends. Right? Unbeknownst to my parents, of course, because I was going to a prestige school. I went to St. Mary's College, you know, so they thought I was a good boy. I went to a very good school and, and I was doing my work as far as they know. But I liked to lie, so I used to skip school a lot. They didn't have any idea. They thought I was going to school and coming back home, but they didn't know. Of course, you wouldn't tell them that, right? <laughs> I wouldn't tell them, hey, you know, I didn't go to school today. No, but. You know, I used, to, I used to do that a lot. Um, they didn't have any clue. I've been doing that for a long time, and they didn't have any clue. Until one day, 
One of my friends called me on the phone. Those days they had a cell phone, so you just had the home phone. So I had the home phone, man. So try not to speak quiet in that. Don't want my parents to hear me. So I tell them about all my escapades that day that didn't include anything to do with school. And I was well chatting away, but I did not know that when the phone rang, my mother picked up one of the lines thinking it was for her. Oh. And when she was about to hand it up and I realized it was for me, she heard something. And she decided to listen. And she heard everything. <laughs> right? And I didn't know. So I, I had my long conversation and told everything in detail to my friend. And when I hung up, my mother didn't have to tell me that she knew. You know why? I saw it in her face. <coughs> and even now that I'm telling you that story, my paws are raising. You know why? Because it didn't bother me so much that I had been courting. What bothered me was the disappointment in her face. She cried. Before she got a chance to accuse me, tears came from her eyes. And I felt like zero. I was just a hero on the phone, talking about all my escapades, and now I'm zero, from hero to zero. Because of her face, because of her eyes, because of her tears, I felt terrible. Now, when I was lying in and skipping school, <clears throat> I knew that my parents would not prove of that. I knew that. I knew that well enough to not tell them. I knew that they would be disappointed if they found out. But still, it hurt. And it hurt me deeply when I saw her face. Although I would have expected that she would have been disappointed. It, it kills you to see your parents so disappointed in something that you did. Because you know that they didn't teach you to do that. Yeah. You know that you went against the instructions. You know all that they sacrificed and all that they, all the time and the effort that they spent behind you Amen. to try to raise you and help you and yes. teach you yes. to come and disappoint them now. It's a terrible feeling. I mean, I, I'm sure all of you here would have disappointed your parents or somebody that you love at some point in time. That doesn't feel good. But why don't we feel like that when we disappoint God? Is it because we don't see His face? Is it, is it because we don't see His eyes? Hmm. Is it because we don't see the tears? Amen. Is something wrong when we don't feel that? <clears throat> Definitely. Definitely. Because as I always try to tell myself, to remind myself, God always sees everything. We know that, right? It's a popular saying, it's a Christian cliche. God sees and knows everything, and He's everywhere. It's true. It might be a cliche. It's true. But it has become such a cliche that we don't really allow it to sink in and mean something anymore. But let it mean something again. Just imagine you would do something wrong, but by yourself, in the darkness, in the closet, by yourself. Nobody else was around, nobody saw. You know when we do things in, 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 in secret, we think that we are okay. We walk out of that secret place and we say, Oh, I'm a lucky boy. Nobody didn't see that. Nobody didn't hear that. Nobody doesn't know that. But God knows. Amen. And God sees. Amen. And God hears. And God is there with you when you're doing it. Amen. Imagine that. So if, if you were in a room, let's say, just try an example. Let's say the case of a drug addict, right? The drug addict, drug addict knows that he should not be doing drugs. It's destroying his life. He knows that, right? And, then, and it's a fact because they said cocaine addicts, most cocaine addicts don't want to be in cocaine anymore. They say that. If you ask them, they don't want to be on it anymore, but they can't help it. So imagine a cocaine addict in a room. He's sitting there and he's watching his cocaine on the table. He's telling himself, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this. I promised my parents I will not do this anymore. They believe me, they trusted me, I'm not going to do this. And then he pays it and he takes it and he partakes. 
but he does it in a room, nobody saw him. So he feels like, well, I just have to come home from this high, walk out of this room, and nobody will ever know that I did this. Amen? Amen. Imagine that. But if that cocaine addict had somebody in that room with him, would it have been easier or harder for him to do the drugs? It would have been harder because he would have had somebody in his line of sight that he is accountable to. And this is how we operate. And that's why it's good to have brethren. Amen? That's why it's good to be a part of assembly. Because when we can be accountable to one another, Amen. we are less likely to fall. And even if we do fall, we have brethren to help us to get back up. Amen? Amen? Amen. But in the case of the drug addict, he was by himself. If he could have imagined or remembered that God is right there with him in that room, it would have been just as effective as if somebody was physically sitting there with him. Not so? Amen. And it's the same thing for all of us. If we could have God foremost on our minds at all times, then we will not forget that he is there with us. Amen? And many of the wrong things that we might do in secret, we will think twice, three times, four times about doing it because we know that God is present. Amen? Amen. So that's just something I wanted to share. So we understand that God had a purpose for men. Even in the story of Adam and Eve going up to Cain and Abel and Noah, God had a purpose for men. He told them and they knew. Amen? But what about the second part of the title of the message? Man's ambitions. Now this story here, in Genesis 11, it shows man's ambitions. You know? In verse 4, I believe. Yes. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make, let us, make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the world. So we, hear, we see here many different things. They wanted to build a city on a tower, right? Nothing's wrong with that, right? What's wrong with that? Nothing. Building a city on a tower, nothing is wrong with that. Men have been doing it for from a long time now. Yes. A long time, many years. Men have been building cities and towers. Right? Not wrong. So we go on. Whose top may reach unto heaven? Now that didn't literally mean that they're going to try to build up unto heaven. It just meant that they're going to build a very high top. I guess nothing's wrong with that either, right? When I've been building high towers, nothing's wrong with that. And let us make us a name. Now, we start to realize what's wrong. The ambition. The ambition. Now, having a large group of men in a place, it makes sense for them to build a city. They have to live somewhere. It might even make sense to build a tower for security reasons. But this next part, and let us make us a name. That is the true ambition there. To make a name for whom? For themselves. Because they said, let us make us a name. Amen? So we see where it starts to change. And they didn't want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Which I guess nothing is wrong with that either. It's good for men to dwell amongst each other. We are social beings, amen? But that part, where they said, let us make us a name. They wanted to glorify themselves. And they took the things that would have done ordinarily not been so bad or so wrong. And made them very wrong and so bad. <clears throat> so now that city that they were building and that tower that they were building were not just a city and a tower anymore. It was a monument to what's themselves, which is found upon by God. Amen? Amen? So that goes to show another point that even though you might be in the right, <coughs> you might be doing something that is not <coughs> wrong, you could make it wrong. <coughs> Just by your attitude or your ambition. Amen. Amen? 
how careful we need to be. How careful we need to be because the Lenin City and Tower is not wrong. But the attitude and the reason that they were doing it made it something terrible that God Himself had to intervene. And I, I, I often like to draw an illustration that you could be right and make yourself so wrong. You could be in a confrontation with someone and you could be the one in the right and the person could be the one in the wrong and you could make yourself more wrong than the person although you were originally in the right I said that in a way that's very confusing I'm sorry, I'll show you what I mean Imagine I am driving down the road and Curtis is driving behind me as he should be because my car is much better than his so his car is behind mine and Curtis wasn't paying attention and he hit the back of my car. <coughs> Who's wrong? Curtis, right? Curtis is wrong. He hit the back of my car because he was not paying attention. Who's right? I am right. I didn't do anything wrong. So I am right and Curtis is wrong. However, if I come out of my car and I start yelling at Curtis and I slap him and say, why did you bounce the back of my car? Who is more wrong now? <laughs> I have made myself more wrong than Curtis because there is an avenue to deal with the accident. The avenue to deal with the accident is just that there was an accident. Curtis didn't purposely come and hit my car. Curtis didn't purposely damage his own car. It was an accident. The proper avenue to take would have been to go through the insurance companies and deal with the problem. But no. Now, we have a different thing to deal with. I just assaulted Curtis. So now, the avenue of insurance company and dealing with just a, a small car accident is, is, is minor. We have a more serious thing to deal with. Now the police could be called and I could be charged for assault and I could be in jail. Amen? I made myself more wrong than Curtis. Now, God provides a way for us to deal with our situation. Right? Yeah. We could be in wrong. And he has provided a way for us to deal with this situation, which is to humble ourselves, come before him and ask for forgiveness. Amen. Amen? But sometimes we could choose not to go through the avenue that God provided. And choose our own way to deal with what happened. And you know what happens when we choose our own way? We mess everything up. I mean, always make things worse. Just like the illustration I just drew. There was a simple accident that could have been dealt with through insurance easily. But I made it worse. Because I thought I was right. And I could do whatever I want because I'm right. It doesn't work that way, amen? So, we have to remember that. There's an avenue to deal with things. God has made a way for us. Imagine that. We don't even have to make a way ourselves. We don't have to come up with the plan. We don't have to write the manual. We don't have to do the research to figure out how to do it. All that has been done. It's all been put here. We just have to follow the instructions. Amen. Amen. That's easy to do. That's easy to do. But we make it so difficult. And what 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 makes it difficult and why we make it difficult is because of our heart and our attitude. Amen? Our emotions that we don't know how to ride up. Our tongue that is wayward. Our thoughts that are corrupted. This is the, these are the things that we lean on as human beings. And God has taught us not to. He has shown us how evil our heart and our tongue can be and our mind. But yet still, mankind tries to lean on his own mind. He tries to lean on his own heart. He tries to lean on his own tongue. And it gets him in trouble. Over and over and over again. And he will not learn. Amen? Amen. So, we have to be careful <coughs> not to allow our ambitions, our plans, to get into the way of what God wants for us. 
Amen. It, it led Adam and Eve out of the promised land of, of the garden where everything was perfect for them. It led them out to release their ambitions, their plans, their thoughts, their heart. It led Cain even further east when he was reproved by God. And he murdered his own brother and led him further east. And then now, in this, in this story also with Noah and his, and his children, it led them further east. And this story will be top of battle. These men were building monuments unto themselves, not giving any glory to God whatsoever. God himself, the Bible says, came in to intervene in the later verses. In verse 5 it says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children and men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So imagine, he, God is saying that these people have imagined just a city and a tower now, but who knows what they will imagine next? Amen? And we don't want to even begin to imagine what they would have imagined next because we know our own thoughts, right? Then God says in verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. How wise is the Lord, amen? So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And then what happened? They left off to build the city. So that's why the name of the city is called Babel. Babel means confused. So, God in his wisdom and in, in the way that only God probably would do, he came down and he dealt with the situation by making all of them speak different languages. If it was me or you had to deal with that, I'm sure we would not have thought of that. But God did. And he scattered them and they couldn't understand each other and they had to leave and everybody went his different way. But God had to get involved in because men were starting to glorify themselves. And nowadays, <coughs> men are glorifying themselves in many different ways. Amen? And we see it all the time. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And many of the, the people who call themselves the church do the same thing. Sometimes they might not, might not glorify themselves, but they might glorify the man who is standing where I am standing now. We see a lot of that today. They glorify the man on the pulpit and not the man he's supposed to be the vessel for. Amen? Yeah. And that is dangerous. They depend on the man standing on the pulpit to teach them everything. And they do not search for themselves. Nowadays, if you ask a child a question and they don't know the answer, you know what they want to do? They're going to Google it. Even the little, little ones. That's, that's what we reach. If you really want information in this world, it's easy to get. On the internet, right? It's a useful tool. But yet, the children of God, the, the saints of the church, they depend on the man of the pulpit alone for their word. If they were truly interested in the word, and the message of the Lord. Google it. Search it, face it, if you're really interested, right? Anything that we're interested in now in our lives, you want to find out something about it, go on the internet. And it takes seconds. You find out whatever you want to find the information in a flash. But the word, there's no interest there. There's barely an interest for an hour at a time on a Sunday. There's barely an interest there. To hear the word. Father is the one research on your own at home. Our time at home is not for that. Amen. Our time at home is for whatever else. Whatever else. Amen. We need to be careful of that. Amen. So this is my this is my message today, uh, tonight. Is do not allow our ambitions to get in the way of what God intends. Amen? Amen. 
we have to be careful. It's not, it doesn't mean that we can't achieve, we can't aspire. It doesn't mean that. Of course not. Yes, you can have goals and you can seek out your goals and you might have ambitions and plans for your future. That's perfectly fine and that's wise as, as a matter of fact. But it must not replace God. Amen. Amen. It must not be number one. In fact, it must be subject to God's will. So we must present it before Him, Amen. our plans. We must present our ambitions before Him. And let it be in subjection to His will. Because His will is perfect. Our plans, our mind, is flawed. And if we subject our plans and our ambitions to ourselves, we are sure to end up with failure. Many people think that they are successful because they are fine and that, that means that they will be okay. But sometimes they store treasures here on earth and they do not store them up in heaven. We are wise though. Are we not wise in this house? That we prefer to store treasures in heaven. Amen. Amen. The story of Lazarus and, and, and the rich man is a perfect example. The rich man had all the luxuries of life here on earth. Lazarus was a sufferer. He suffered. But his treasures were stored up in heaven. And in eternity, Lazarus lived in luxury. But in eternity, the rich man suffered. What is this life in comparison to eternity? It's nothing. So let's be wise. Let's store up our treasures in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's object our ambitions and our plans and our will to God Amen. and His purpose. Amen? Amen. I just want to invite you to sing this song with us. Amen. Well, with Brother Eddie, not me. And um, then we'll pray. Amen. And then I'll handle what I'm doing.